celestial bodies of creation Each of us longing for the truth Remnants of these broken planets Scattered through the universe Like asteroids of ancient granite Cycles of rebirth. All oh, we are are shining stars suspended in a boundless sky. Don't you know we're not too far to hear what's just beneath? Together. Cosmic shades of second chances Rays of hope around the sun Making peace with circumstances Hoping for peace for everyone Cause all we are are shining stars Suspended in a boundless sky These primal wounds can keep us from finding home Inside the telescope where all is magnified Light moves through time and space across the great divide Beyond the distant starlight gleam When nothing's what it seems there is no ground Cause all we are are shining stars suspended in a boundless sky. Don't you know we're not too far to hear what's just beneath? Cause all we are are shining stars suspended in a boundless Hey, welcome every morning, everybody. Good morning. <laughs> welcome everyone. Good morning. I was just watching that. I'm Jeanette Yoff, founder of Celia Center and Cami Jenny Alpert. That's her new song, Constellation, about the foster care and adoption constellation. So without further ado, I would like to welcome to the Saturday morning keynote. We are seeking identity through hip hop, rap, and spoken word this morning. 
And today we do have a special guest all the way from Staten Island, New York. She has utilized music as her platform to share her story of international adoption and speak to things that matter to her. So why are the performing arts important for understanding and healing? Performing arts can help us understand our history, our culture, our lives, and the experience of others in a manner that cannot be achieved through other means. We get moved by watching something. The performing arts gives us a place to gather as a society like today. The performing artist influences society by changing opinions, instilling values, and translating experiences across space and time. Arts help us heal, boost our self-esteem and communication, and music is the best studied of art therapy and helps to lower anxiety, depression, trauma, psychosis, and stress. Amazing. Music is very powerful. So listen and lean in as an adoptee, he son, shares how she found their voice, her faith, and her identity through the performing arts, utilizing music while seeking her identity in search for herself. She isn't your average hip hop MC. She was placed for adoption in her native South Korea at the age of four months. She was brought to America and raised by Chinese American parents on Staten Island, New York. All of her diverse experiences have fused to create the illuminating backdrop for her first album, Redefined. After having her first child in 2012, she followed up with her sophomore album, Stereotypes, that has been released on iTunes and other outlets on January 21st, 2014. It placed number seven on iTunes Christian Gospel Charts and number 24 on Billboard Christian Gospel. His son's third album, Beauty for Ashes, was released on October 14th, 2016 as an independent art artist. She made her comeback to music with tracks that highlighted her personal challenges. In 2017, she auditioned for South Korea's popular rap Korean TV show, Show Me the Money. She was the only female to make it from the United States and survived three rounds. Her fourth album, Flying Cars, dropped on March 8th, 2019 and hit 14 on iTunes hip hop charts. In 2021, He Sun signed as a teaching artist with Thrive Collective, an art education organization that brings murals, music, and media into New York City public schools. She recently completed graduate school to obtain her master's degree in special education and is also working on new music and raising her two daughters. I welcome He Sun. Good morning, and thank you so much for being here with us. Yes, thank you for having me. It's an really honor. Really a treat. Yeah. So I would like to ask you a few questions. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> about your your story. What about your being born in Korea? What what do you know about yeah. your story? Because sometimes, you know, being adopted internationally, we don't get the story of your early childhood right. experience. So what do and, you, you know? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. No, I mean, unfortunately, that is um that is the case uh with me. I really don't know much about my adoption and I've tried um not so many times, but enough uh, from what I can do here. Uh, being, you know, I'm on my adoption papers, it says that I was given up at four months. Um, I don't have any, no information on, they have my parents' names on the adoption papers, but then I don't know, I don't know if this is a Korean thing, but they're always saying that um, they could be falsified just for the sake of just, you know, hiding who they really are. I mean, there's no, nothing like definite on the papers and then they had um the name of my birthing clinic so just to not make this long when i was adopted my mom my adoptive mother had my adoption papers and on there didn't have my parents names it didn't have my my birthing clinic where i was born and then when i started investigating on my own in college i went to my uh adoption agency which was Spence chapin and they gave me a whole they gave me the same adoption papers but like stuff was whited out when they gave it to my adoptive mother. So when I went personally to, to just, you know, look for things, that's when they showed me my birth parents' names and they showed me my birthing clinic name. But again, they were like, oh, this may not be real. 
but it was just something I never saw before. So that I was like, oh my gosh, this is, this is amazing. I have information now, um, you know, and being limited from here to South Korea, I tried with the information that I had, but it's just, and my last name in Korean is very, very rare, which is a good and a bad thing because, you know, if you have the last name Kim in Korean, there's like millions of Kims. And so that's mm -hmm. very hard. But with my last name, it's just, it's very hard to just find anyone. And again, I don't really know how much I can do from, from America. Um, and unfortunately I didn't get very far. So that's mm -hmm. currently where I'm at right now, but I do know I have three older brothers. I do know I have names of my birth parents. I just don't know if they're real. Oh, so you have three biological brothers, you know of? That's what it says on my adoption papers. Mm -hmm. And they said, I, and they couldn't afford a fourth child. So she, my, my mother gave me up. I mean, she had birth. And then in Korea, what they do is they don't name you like in America, they name you right when you give birth. Um, they don't do that in Korea. Like you have to go somewhere to get an official name. So I wasn't named. So my mom gave birth to me. And then I guess she just left after, I mean, she made, you know, made sure I was well taken care of. And then I guess she, you know, she didn't name me. So <laughs> I see. And the significance of your name, he son, you named. No. So I went into foster care uh, for the four months I was there and my foster mother named me he son. And again, all on my adoption papers, I'm assuming that's the truth, <laughs> you know, so that's, that's where I got he son from. Yeah. Let's see. Do you know anything about your foster mother? I don't, I don't know her name. Like I wanted to try and contact her, but. I just have a picture of her holding me. Oh. Yeah, I got it from my adoption agency. She was holding me and all. I don't even see her face. I just see like, she's looking down at me. So I just kind of see like the back of her head and her hand. <laughs> oh. She looked like an older lady. So I don't even know if she's still alive. And uh, I mean, time is ticking here. <laughs> right. So, so yeah. you lived with her for four months. Yeah. And then your parents came from New York to South Korea. So I was actually um, flown here. I'm, yeah, they oh. did everything from here. That I didn't have. They didn't have to go to Korea. Ah, okay, yeah. interesting. Because yeah, so they met me at the airport. <laughs> I see. Do you have photos of that? Yes, my my mom, my adopted mom, a whole photo album <laughs> oh, of wow. me getting off the plane. Yeah. <laughs> so, what did, what what was it like growing up from South Korea in Staten Island, New York? Yeah. Right? What was that like for you? Did you feel different than the others? Did you have any mirroring in your life? I mean, it came later on um, in the beginning, you know, being young, I, cause where I live, it's not a lot of Asian American. Well, now there are, but when I was growing up, we were very few, you know? And so, but I don't know, my mom, my parents are very Americanized. They were born here. So we, they integrated fine with, you know, white people I guess so they I didn't feel like I was different I had a great childhood my parents were just you know they're my parents so they I didn't notice anything different until I started getting older and I could process things and understand and my mom and dad always told me I was adopted I never like not knew I don't even remember when they told me it must have just been when I could cognitively understand so um yeah it wasn't until I got older where I was like okay I'm Korean my parents are Chinese I don't know a lot of Korean people around me. And as I got into high school, then I started feeling more and more lost. Um, but growing up, it wasn't like that. I felt fine. It wasn't until I got older. And yeah. how have you dealt with your identity? How did you deal with that in adolescence? Yeah, so I, yeah. I, it was, Racist, I, right. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I didn't go like off the wall, but I was, I was going through a lot. My mom was very worried for me. I did find God. I, I, that's how my faith helped me. It's kind of grounded me a lot. Um, so I started going to church and stuff. But I mean, even with that, you know, as Christians, we say that God is our identity. This is, you know, it doesn't matter whether you know your birth parents or not. Like your identity is formed through who God called you to be, which you know, essentially, I still believe. But sometimes you just you just want more. You just want to know what you, why you look like this. It's just basic questions you have. So, um, yeah, I just started, I got, I started writing a lot. Um, I started getting into hip hop and I would just write my thoughts. I was always into expressing myself. That was the outlet for me. And, um, 
yeah, it just kind of just manifested into something bigger when I got into um, my freshman year of college. That's when I really pursued the music thing. But I would say music and um, my my faith. That's what kept me grounded. I, I feel like I don't know what I could have gotten into had I not had those things. But um, yeah, the expressive arts and putting pen yes. to paper, yes. putting your thoughts down and out and expressing yeah. them out. Yeah. So do you feel close to your Korean roots now? Yeah, I do. I'm because especially with music. So I, when I started doing music, I was, I, I didn't like being Korean because I, a lot of Korean people I felt were judging me because I could, I can't speak Korean. I don't have a Korean background. And for some reason you have to prove to people that you are a culture instead of just being born. It isn't enough. Like you have to have all these things and I, I, didn't, I didn't have it. So Korean people would always judge me, not all Korean people, but I had some bad experiences, so I went on strike, and I'm like, I'm not Korean anymore, and then I got into hip-hop, not that I thought I was Black or anything, but I just, I I don't know, I, I identified so, and you know, hip-hop is a culture, and obviously a lot of African Americans are, you know, they're in it, so, but I don't know, I just related more to them, like they were more understanding of what I was going through than my own race and that is a great thing and it's also a sad thing you know so they understood my feeling of abandonment and I have I felt more I felt more culturally connected to them than to my own race and I'm obviously not black I'm not I don't I didn't grow up in a hip-hop community or a culture but just being into music and just having a genuine love for it and then you know them hearing my story and what I went through they embraced it and they cultivated it and they helped me to, you know, be a rapper, like, you know, so again, that was another aspect of my life where I feel like I could have taken a, a wrong turn there too, but because I found this, this culture and this place for me that really embraced me and they didn't judge me. They didn't say, oh, who's this Asian girl trying to rap? What, you know, or all this appropriation and what is she trying to do? Like they, they were so loving and it was to this day, like my closest friends, you know, like. And I'm more confident in myself now. So it's like, okay, yeah, I'm Asian rapping, but because I kind of have a background on it now, I feel a little bit more confident. Like, yes, I'm a rapper and this and that, but it's just very interesting how cultures work and, you know, how you can find more relatability. I don't know if, that, if that's a word in another culture than your own sometimes. I don't know. Yeah, I think that there's some shared wounds too of being a marginalized society, discriminated against. Yes, there you right? go. Right. And there's that bond. Yeah. That unspoken bond. That yeah. Yeah. I like that. Any that's culture good. that feels marginalized. Yeah. Unacknowledged. Yeah. That's pretty. Yeah. That's how I felt. Yeah. Now you can write that song. <laughs> okay, I'll give you credit. Okay. Uh, yes. So we are going to show your lap video. Can you tell us a little bit about that? And then yeah. we'll show that video. Okay. So yeah, I came up with this a couple of years ago. I had this vision because I don't know how many of uh, you guys who are adopted, we vi I visualize so much what it would be like if I met my birth mother or she didn't give me up for adoption and the moments that I could have had with her, especially when we're babies and we're newborns, because that's where you connect. And, you know, me being a mother myself, I will look down at my my daughters when they were young and I'm envisioning what I would have had if I had my birth mother there. So it was so like, I don't know, like just picturing them in your lap, like my my birth mother holding me in my lap. And that's the first thing I kept thinking about, like, I never experienced that. And when I hold my own children in my lap, it's just the most precious thing in the world. Only when they're sleeping, <laughs> for the most part. <laughs> but um, yeah, so then I was thinking, let me do this from all perspectives. A birth mother who has the daughter in her lap. And then now that she gave the child up for adoption, all you see is an empty lap because the, birth, the, the, the child isn't there. And what is the birth mother feeling because she has an empty lap, right? And then what is the baby who is who is us? What are we feeling? We want to be in somebody's lap and we're, we're just in foster care. We're, you know, we're just in the air somewhere, right? And then the adoptive perspective, the adoptive parents who are longing for a child and they have an empty lap too. So it's kind of like, this is such a significant you know, vision for all of us. Like, what does it feel like from all perspectives? And just that, that lap, you know, the baby in a mother's lap. So yes, it's how it really beautiful. And, yeah. and you're, you, you talk about and show all perspectives, which is what Celia Center is about. Yeah. We're all here. 
we have adoptees, adoptive parents, and first parents. Yeah. So we are all in this together. So I would love to show this video now. It's so yeah, I was born into a life without a mother. Anytime I talk about it, then I stutter. She gave birth to me, but not like any other. She left me right away. I never had a chance to love her. I'm crying every night, looking for her face, looking for a trace of her. Must be in the wrong place. Now I'll never know my own race. The pain's coming. I wasn't asked to be born in case you try to prove something. This ain't even fair. I never had a chance. You made your mind up before you gave a second glance. And now I'm laying here, staring at the ceiling. The pain that I'm feeling. A newborn baby that already needs healing. Healing. Uh, I'm gonna close my eyes now and think of where you at. I'll daydream of the life we could have had if you held me in your arms and placed me in your lap. It's not how it seems. I love you endlessly. I'm sorry. belly every day and think about you nine months of my life i didn't live without you you was all of me i was all of you but poverty was all around me it was all i knew all i do is think about it call for you but you deserve a better life wish i could give it all to you i would cry with your daddy every night no matter what i'm going through to give you up was never right me on hey life is hard and i'm sorry that i couldn't fight this to leave my daughter hanging it's the worst thing imagine could i do The chance for me to have my own child is never, never, never ever, never ever get to hold you tightly. This might be the hardest thing that's ever tried to fight me. I'm looking in the mirror thinking life is trying to spite me. I'm slightly losing it. The doctor said politely, there's hope though. I'm looking all around, where's it at? I don't know. My husband tried to grab me. I said I won't go. I'm not leaving till I get some better news. Till the doctor says I can have a child if I choose. So love and care for, that's what a mother's there for. He said adoption can bring my hope back. Another baby out there could meet me where I'm at. I'll daydream about it, thinking I could have a child. So hold in my arms forever in my lap. It's not how it seems. I love you endlessly. I'm sorry I couldn't fight this. Gotta try and find my own peace of mind. Baby, can't you see? That's 
so powerful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Really. Very moving. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what would you like to share with us now? You said you may do some spoken word. Yeah. So I, um, another spoken word that I had on one of my albums was called bloodlines. And, um, so the whole purpose of bloodlines is pretty much as adoptees, um, we don't have a bloodline. Like my whole life, I was never connected to somebody bloodline like, right? So, I mean, you, my, they say, you know, think you don't always have to be connected through blood. Obviously, you know, love is what connects us. My adoptive parents, that's my family. But sometimes just knowing that you can see somebody the same way that you see yourself, like just physical dimensions of it, it's, it's, it's something that I never was able to experience until um, I had children. And this was like the first bloodline that I was able to ever fully say, hey, my daughter looks like me. She has my eyes. So I, I wrote a poem about it. Um, it is a little bit long, so I'll try not to um, do a lot of pauses here. And I really hope that you all can just be blessed by it, you know, if you relate to it. Um, yeah. So here we go. Hey, I'll um, spotlight your video. Here we go. Yeah. <laughs> I used to think I was unfortunate. Unfortunate to live a life that could never tell me the origins of my story. See, most people know how they were born. Most people know where they were born and most people know why they were born. But unfortunately, I was never given those details in my adoption papers. Unlike most children who can lightheartedly run to their parents and tap them on their shoulders to ask them how they so lovingly entered into this world, I, unfortunately, can only speak to the made-up faces that are constantly lurking around in my dreams. These made-up faces, aka my so-called birth parents, are only temporary visions to keep my sanity in check. Because the truth is, I don't know anything about my existence. I don't know if I was a mistake a blessing, a life that was meant to be loved, but unfortunate circumstances made caring for me impossible, I don't know. And while I cherish the privileged life that my adoptive family has provided me with, there was only one unfortunate detail that even they could not give to me, a bloodline. It's what ties families together, what they subconsciously depend on when they look each other in the eyes. It's how families are identified and strengthened. These bloodlines carry the same DNA, the same makeup that makes up a family. Bloodlines that flow continuously through similar veins. They extend through generations, never losing its value. Bloodlines connect lives. They connect souls. It was something that I missed, something that once passed through me and then was cut off at my fingertips. I never had a bloodline. And so for that, I was unfortunate. Until my daughter was born. I have two daughters now, but this I wrote this when I only had one. Uh, she's about to turn four. And there hasn't been one day where I didn't learn, look at her and forget that I now have a bloodline. I can finally look at someone and physically see myself in them. I can see my lips in hers. I can study the presence of her big and cheerful eyes and know that I gave them to her. I comb her hair every morning, examining each strand and embracing its texture, proudly knowing that it's the same as mine. My ears boast at the sound of long-awaited compliments from strangers and friends telling me my daughter looks like me. And this is a new world for me. And now, now I feel fortunate for that. See, bloodlines that have spoiled and settled down in people have caused them to take for granted life's most simplest and purest blessings. Being able to create a life inside of me and see my daughter possess my traits is a mind-blowing experience that every day I thank God for. And without ever feeling unfortunate, I would never be able to fully grasp the deepest understanding of being fortunate enough to have a bloodline. Thank you. Yeah, I just felt, you know, like I said, it's not not everything's about a bloodline, but you know, when you lack it, you know, people take it for granted, like my husband's family, they all look the same, you know, so it's just little things like that, you know, you kind of feel without. So, you know, it's, it's the little things, just being able to see certain traits that my daughter has, you know, it was worth a poem. So, <laughs> and are you, for any Korean adoptees out there, are you involved in any 
organizations where you do feel mirrored and connected to because that's important for us to know where yeah so there's a an organization in new york city it's called also known as and um they're pretty good like um i the girl the singer that was in the laugh video she was a a big um she i don't know what position she held in also known as but she helped me like uh, she knows so many Korean organizations that I don't even know of. So I did a lot of shows with her with also known as um, they do Korean. Um, I think it's every three years, all the Korean adoptees. We have conferences held in Korea. And this happened this past summer. I could not go because uh, flights are super expensive, but all Korean adoptees from all over the world go to this conference. And it's amazing. I mean, I, I really want to experience it. And I know also known as is a part of it. So it's great. It's like Korean people speaking all different languages, every language but Korean in Korea. And we all kind of get together and just share oh, things. That what What is the name of that? Do you know? Yeah, the, I could. Uh, I, I, it's not. Uh, what if, is it, the well, I could put it under this chat. Uh, yeah. If you tell me, email me, because we may have parents who have adopted from Korea. Okay. And this yeah. For their children. Okay. All right. I don't know why it's escaping me. I don't know if it's called the gathering. I forgot. I will get that to you. Okay. Fantastic. Very fast. Yeah. Right. Sorry last... about that. Oh, that's fine. So <laughs> we're at the end of our time. Thank you for being with us. Any last yeah. minute updates, events you're doing? How do we follow you? Find you? Yeah. Um, I'm always, uh, yeah, I'm still active. I'm always putting music out. If you guys look at my social media stuff. So my name is uh, He Sun Lee. And then my Instagram is just Miss MS He Sun Lee. Uh, you can just go on my website, he sun Lee.com. Pretty, uh, pretty easy. And um, yeah, I got singles dropping. Um, always still performing. I do a lot of um, uh, Korean events now, Korean festivals. We try and hit them all up within the country, but um. Not that I'm doing everyone in the country, but I'm trying. Um, and just any, any, you know, if anybody out there needs an artist, any shows you got coming up, you know, I'd be more than happy to connect with you. Um, and yeah, I hope my music can be a blessing to you guys um, and just help anyone out there who needs guidance. You know, we're all in this together. So I really appreciate the fact that you brought me on here tonight, today, and let me share my story. So yeah, awesome. thank you. So well, much. you're very talented. We wish you <laughs> success. Keep going because it's really yeah. important. And what you're doing matters. Thank you so much. So thank you. And uh, we'll see you soon. Good luck right. with everything. All right. Thank Take you. Care.